body to the flow. The next talk that we have is we're going to talk about plastic fighting COVID. This is going to be presented by Filippi Fagungis. He's the PDI uh, Research Manager, Development and Innovation for the group FCC. You are most welcome, Filippi Fagungis, and I hope you give us a good lecture. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here today to talk about this subject, to bring the uh, vision of FCC in the fight against COVID. Uh, plastic is still um, has a, a role in this mission that belongs to all of us. So as I said, I am the manager for research and innovation in FCC. And I hope during the next few minutes that we will be able to give you a good presentation that we'll be able to have a good discussion in the end related to this issue of COVID-19 and plastic. Uh, Before introducing the topic, I think it's very important for me to tell you who we are. Well, we are an industry, we're 52 years old. We began our story in the shoe industry, in the Valley dos Sinos, in the state of Rio Grande do Sul, and we diversified our portfolio of products and we diversified the markets we work in. And today I can tell you that we have some important uh, things to be proud of. We, uh, we make elastomers in South America where when all the vehicles that are produced in Brazil we make polymeric masses as well with the largest producer. And we also work with uh, truck bodies and other products for vehicles. I'm sure that other several uh, colleagues who are listening to me, they have this, they go through the situation because I can say that a lot of people that hear me have um, transported themselves with one of our products, have brushed their teeth with some of our products, but often we're not known. It depends on the chain because we uh, manufacture these raw materials. It's also important, and there's a strong context based on what I'm going to present to you, which is our goal. So in one statement, I can summarize who we are, what our goal is, and what we are in quest of. What we want is to support the market, our clients, and what uh, is the passion of our collaborators. So we search for the new, transforming ideas into materials that change the world. And I hope to share a bit of this with you during the next slides. Before I go into the topic, I talked about our purpose to transform ideas in products that change the world. And I also want to tell you how we organize ourselves for this and the solution and the vision that we bring here is not by chance. It happens. It's a fruit of a process of an innovation. Structure. Recording stopped. We Recording in progress. Then, and we have this very well structured in the company. So the transformation of an idea, of a concept, in a product, in a solution for the market, in a solution for our client, it goes through well-known steps. And every time we think about ideas, every time we try to transform an idea into a product, we have some criteria which we take into consideration. One of them is to increase the client's success. So we want to increase the success of the chain and of this product. We want to also uh, be ahead of the trends and the trends that COVID brought us and for our productive chain and for consumption. And of course, we want to take care of sustainability and also ESG. We're talking, even though it's very important, 
the environmental, but the economical and the social aspects are also extremely important. Well, still in this process, it's important to talk, to see how a concept like this and how it's treated. We talk about process, we talk about speed. So we have a pandemic that started in the beginning of last year and how I grab these concepts and try to transform a product into a solution. For this, we have specific channels that um, dealt with, with people at different speeds according to the complexity of this idea. And here, as you can see in this chart, these uh, three innovation horizons are very much uh, well known, brought to us by McKinsey, and we adapt this to our reality. So how we get a concept and we translate it, this into prototypes and then into a solution and then onto the market. And the idea is that each new idea has a different journey to be able to take this to the market. Another important vision is that we say that things don't happen by chance, but it's also a fruit of a series of players, a series of processes. That vision that we have a researcher locked up in a room and he has a bright idea, that does not happen. In our vision, what we what exists are these connections, is as, as if it's, we have a whole a parts of a puzzle that have to be put together. And what happens sometimes, of course, is that some groups don't even know that they own that specific part of the puzzle. So then we create these moments and connections to reach this innovative product. And what we're gonna bring is this innovative concept to help uh, sanitary crisis. Now, moving into reality that we're going through, because we talk a lot about the new normal, but it's already normal, right? Because we've been going through this for over a year. So in the first semester of last year, using these concepts that I've just told you, and that we quickly went through and also due to our history in the shoe industry we found the following situation we, we were still adapting ourselves to the reality to, of the pandemic the use of masks washing hands not going out from our homes lockdown but even then we had groups that had to work that had to go out, people that had to produce services and go back home. So how could we support this process? Bringing safety to people. And in the first semester, the concept of our antiviral shoe sole uh, appeared. So we thought, well, besides this, we could also have other elements that uh, support other um, parts so that support this going back to normal. So how can we adapt ourselves to the reality that we're living through and at the same time being able to produce something and that helps us go back to our normal rhythm in our lives, leisure, etc. So it's a bit of what I'm going to tell you, how we got this uh, concept, this trend, and we were able to promote a solution. So I'm going to show you this. It's something, materials of KPMG. This talks a little bit, uh, this, the experience of the user, something that everyone knows. You for sure have already seen, and this is a topic that was exhausted in the pandemic, how many times we touch off face during the day and people started to notice also how many different surfaces we touch during a day and the change the planning change that we have to have to go out so before before the pandemic we simply would get the car keys or public transport and off we went now here we're giving an example of a, a journey to go shopping we didn't have big planning. We thought what we wanted to do, but there was no 
incredible planning. Now we have to plan everything. We have to prepare ourselves. We have to take more than one mask. We have to take alcohol gel. If we're going to touch in different, on different surfaces, we have to clean our hands the whole time. So this journey of this client, or the user, we ourselves, we touch several different uh, services we interact with different people and everything is now planned and so it's plan versus concern so the concept is well if this is the trend is if if this is reality how can we in the industry make this process this journey easier for our client for our user so we the raw material manufacturing industry how can we make this new journey easier bringing safety into the process I'm going to give you a personal example. A few years ago, I went, a few weeks ago, I went out to eat a hamburger. So I placed my order electronically at the same, at the place and I waited sitting at the table with, with my boy. When I, when they called me, the order was ready. So I went to fetch it. So I said, well, then I put alcohol gel. I do, I, do this before getting the tray, tray, then I take the tray to the table, then I have to clean my hands again. And what about when I got to get hold of the box? The people that were manipulating the box, were they wearing gloves and a mask? So the numerous concerns in this journey, uh, just to eat something simple or to go to the supermarket or for leisure. So what we're bringing to you is this vision of the changes of habits and the vision of how consumers that before are, are still looking for brands, personal personalized brands, but they also want brands that are worried with safety and protection. So in the list of opportunities we have, we need to think about agility personalization, but also safety in parts and consumption goods for our clients and for our users uh, and everything they touch throughout the day. And just so that I'm not the only one saying this, I brought some uh, quotes that sh represent this mega trend. I have some quotes from websites showing that this is a mega trend that is already true. For example, I brought this one uh, so that we can talk about Beto, Beto Carrero World, a theme park here in the south of Brazil, received an international uh, seal from a biorisk advisory council. So companies are now adapting to the new reality and they understand that consumers, when they make a choice, will choose the companies that can uh, service the no, the level of customization and personification, excuse me, um, uh, personalization that they have, and also in safety. Imagine if a family is going to a theme park, uh, if they're going to be worried about you know their kids uh, using hand sanitizer before going on a roller coaster. So it no longer is all about um, enjoying the situation, but it also becomes a concern. And as an industry, we also have to adapt. We have to offer to the market new solutions or at least additional solutions for this mega trend. But, as many of you probably know, uh, many of you who are listening to us, it wasn't only recently that uh, plastics became an ally for uh, healthcare. It wasn't only because of the pandemic. This is um, something from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, where they had a study on the different materials and how important plastics are in uh, fighting COVID. Most of the devices used today are totally or at least partially made from plastics, such as respirators, thermometers, syringes, uh, tubes, cannulas. And there are a number of materials used to save lives. Also, the packaging material for 
uh, other devices and PPEs. So we know how important plastics are to save lives today in our new reality. One of the biggest advantages is how flexible plastics are in adapting to these situations. So just to illustrate the previous text, I brought some images um, from this study. So here we see different hospital devices, respirators and tubes, and look at how many of the parts are not made of plastic, right? I don't know what the percentage of plastics is here, but I can definitely tell you that most of it is. So this just reinforces how much plastics are already a protagonist in parts and specific equipments, which are very important for fighting COVID. What we want to show you is how this can be further expanded. This is a direct way of fighting COVID in hospitals, but how do we see this in our own daily lives? Again, referring to the user's experience. What is the potential of plastics and how can we support this new megatrend for more safety and protection? So before we talk about how, um, here's some more information on plastics. So some studies were published or are still being published uh, since last year. This is a study from Fiocruz, and we also have a study here from Kampen Duramatin. They discuss the virus's lifespan when it's on a surface. So for how long can a virus remain viable when it's on a surface? Here we're talking about people who might cough or sneeze or touch their face and then touch a surface. For how long is this surface going to remain contaminated? When we're talking about plastics, this uh, represents around 72 hours uh, for the viral RNA to remain available there and contaminate a human being. These are studies from last year. There are still further studies being carried out. We are now getting a better understanding of this. And we can also talk about surfaces um, and how contagious they are when the virus comes to them. So as I said, this is being uh, better studied now, but I brought some more material from Nature and from the CDC. In November, that is one year after the pandemic started in Asia, uh, Chinese authorities have now Required uh, frozen, imported frozen foods to be disinfected. So there is still a risk for uh, contamination. And this is a good practice to maintain our uh, daily life as normal as possible. Looking at a past case, and this was something that we heard a lot about uh, the Diamond Princess, the cruise ship. 17 days after it was completely uh, emptied, they still found viral RNA there. On October 20th, the WHO updated its official guidelines, saying that after people who were infected sneeze, cough, or touch surfaces and objects such as uh, tables and door handles, the virus can still spread. And here we're talking about fomites, which are um, the droplets of saliva that carry viral particles. They're one of our um, theories. That's one of the ways we believe that plastics can uh, help us even more in our daily lives. This picture of a lady cleaning a train was included in this uh, nature study, and it discusses the millions of dollars that have already been spent in the subway in New York. 
So how much investment is being made in cleaning it? Again, facing a mega trend, we see an opportunity. And this is a great opportunity for finding a solution. And this is what we're discussing. Again, discussing surfaces, this is a graph and I don't want to show you only my numbers, but uh, look at how uh, these graphs are inclinated. The first graph shows the fomites, that is the uh, viral uh, particles that are carried in our saliva droplets and how long they live on plastics. Like we said, 72 hours. Then the same study shows how it behaves on different surfaces. The second graph is a copper surface, and we see that the amount of um, active virus drops very sharply, uh, very quickly. And then looking at the different innovation concepts for our group and for our trained uh, staff to see this as a, an opportunity, we can see that there was a way here of offering to the market an additional solution in fighting the pandemic. This is another graph that is, again, directly connected to surfaces. This is a copper surface versus a control surface. So the previous uh, graph was uh, showing viruses, and this one is on bacteria. So look at how different it is. The red section uh, represents the um, bacterial units per square centimeter. And this is very connected to how, what we see in hospitals, right? Beds and other surfaces that are very exposed in hospitals. And we see what uh, the bacterial growth is like in each kind of surface. And this shows the opportunities that we have. How can we take this information and translate it into a product? And how can this product be taken to the market? Again, we had a um, technology pathway, but how do we measure its effectiveness? In 2019, this ISO was updated, and it specifically deals with how antiviral activity is measured on plastics and other non-porous surfaces. So the perspective here is how we can measure viral activity in treated and non-treated surfaces. It's based on this that we've understood that surfaces, once they have reduced viral activity, will provide more safety for the end user. And viral activity here refers to the number of infectious viral particles on a surface. A treated surface should, of course, reduce viral activity, should reduce the number of infectious viral particles, and should lead to non-contamination when we touch them. So this is an international standard that we use to measure it. With ISO 21702, we can um, measure the antiviral activity of uh, surfaces. Okay, so we've talked about a possible technology, how we measure viral activity, and now this is the concept we use. As I've said, we are a 52-year-old chemical industry. We work with thermoplastic elastometers and adhesives, and our understanding of adhesives has brought um, a reflection. If we can solve this issue in any way, so if we can deactivate the virus from uh, infecting human beings, um, it is possible that we can do it through an additive. So this is an image of a viral particle 
This is an image that everyone knows, of course. But besides the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we also uh, have others. This surface is a glycoprotein. That's why they are called uh, envelope viruses. SARS-CoV-2 has a protein envelope. It's protected by this surface. And these tips where viruses inject their viral RNA and DNA are also made of proteins. The concept we use here is that if we can use our adhesive technology to bind uh, these proteins so that they are no longer um, active or viable for contamination, um, that would solve the issue. So this is the concept behind what we used. We discussed this, the virus's morphology, and this shows how it um, infects cells for replication. Differently from bacteria, viruses don't uh, spread on a surface. They need a host. So human beings, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, so first you have a surface and the first step, which is absorption, where the virus invades our cell through its membranes. This usually happens on our mucosa and it penetrates the cell, uh, creates biosyntheses and goes through maturation and then the virus is released in our body. Okay, so how can we use all of this concept, excuse me, all of these concepts we've discussed in the last minutes to block it. This is the idea. By using the concept of an adhesive, by using um, a way of binding these proteins, the protein spikes, and making them uh, inactivate the protein spikes through a treated surface, we can uh, prevent absorption from happening. So if you have a surface treated with an additive, in this case, FCC antivir. With this surface, the virus is deactivated, meaning that it will no longer contaminate you. It blocks its ability to interact with our cells. So this is the underlying mechanism in how we understand we can provide an additional solution in uh, preventing contamination and treating surfaces. So here, going a bit deeper into the technology challenge, how do we make it happen? We always have to consider this. There's uh, a right timing for this. The pandemic is here. As an industry, as suppliers of raw materials, innovation and uh, solutions, we need to offer um, a way out for the market very quickly. If we provide anything like an additive or a process that requires a big change in the productive chain, it will probably take much longer to be adopted. So the biggest uh, challenge in terms of technology here is to provide this solution that I just showed you recently and also maintaining our the mechanical properties of our plastics, facilitating them from being incorporated in polymers and using the same equipment for processing. So making raw materials into uh, end parts and doing this so that for the entire mass of polymers has uh, active polymers. And this needs to be easy. It needs to be safe for whoever is executing um, manufacturing and for the end user. So this is our solution. By using nanotechnology or using very small particles, we hope to interact with the virus to deactivate it, as I showed you before. So we've discussed 
uh, efficacy, we've discussed ISO 21702, which deals with antiviral efficiency. FCC understands that we need to offer a full package. So the industry needs um, an easy and practical solution. We also have an antifungal and antibacterial activity in the same additive. So with a single additive, we can solve a number of challenges the industry faces. And we can also solve a big problem, um, which is the new trend I discussed with you, how users are always seeking safety and protection. It's important to discuss uh, this, which is something that really makes us proud. We feel that we stand out from the rest of the market because we provide high effectiveness against uh, SARS-CoV-2. ISO 21702 allows, uh, analyzes activity on several kinds of viruses. Usually, um, Viruses with envelopes are more difficult. So we're very proud to say that our product is um, approved according to ISO 21702 in approved labs for, uh, or excuse me, against SARS-CoV-2. So it's very uh, effective in its antiviral properties. And also I can tell you uh, one of the biggest concerns, thinking about, you know, how the FCC is uh, um, taking its stand in sustainability, we also follow a norm on uh, soil leaching. So out of all of the additives that we are adding to our plastics, they might be um, harmful for the environment when you think about recycling. This is something that we have been discussing thoroughly in our conference. So we had tests with NBR 2005, and we, under, we have a, a certified that it's not harmful to the environment. So the additive in the polymer mass is not leached out meaning that it's not washed out and it doesn't go to the environment. It doesn't go into the soil when it's disposed of. And this is a very important factor as well when we think about sustainability and when we consider continuous use of additives such as this one. When I talked about the mega trends, you saw that vision of the cleaning of the uh, American subway. This is the reality of our industries, of our day-to-day -day life. When we make a comparison of cleaning versus a treated surface with an antiviral additive, this is more or less the relationship. Imagine the time here, 24 hours. And imagine that uh, the, this is uh, done once every shift. So we're talking about a surface that is frequently manipulated with a series of people. So I clean in the middle of the morning and people manipulate the surface and the concentration, the viral load increases. And then I'm only going to clean again in the middle of the afternoon shift. And the comparison is uh, versus a, a treated surface. So I don't have a replication. I don't have a viral load, which is so large on that surface. So the contamination will also be reduced. So that's an important relationship between the cleanliness and a treated surface. So it's also important to tell you that we've test, uh, tested our product in a series of industries, a series of articles that have been the manufacturers in reactive processes, in extrusion processes, in different uh, materials. So, or in other paper, for example. So our vision, vision attending to that mega trend that I put here and that I 
brought several elements showing that this is a world trend that yes, we have more and more treated surfaces and that we have the possibility making people go back to the activities normally without being so concerned of uh, touching uh, surfaces or being concerned about the contamination. Well, even with all these elements, we continue reinforcing that everything, this is one more player for us to be able to go back to our normal lives, uh, to wash our hands. The use of masks, alcohol, gel, all of this is crucial, vaccination, which is becoming mainstream in Brazil. So we understand that um, we are, what we are offering to the industry is another format of being able to support this pandemic. And we understand that this mega trend is something that has come to stay and that people are more and more concerned, as I said before, with the issue of safety and we in the transformation and raw material industry have to look at this need, this uh, pain that users have uh, told us and we have to offer solutions to the market. So we understand that with this, we are able to show way back from plastic and equipment to fight this, uh, the treated plastic with additives so that we can fight more effectively and uh, attend to this new trend of searching for protection and safety in the day-to-day -day life. So I hope that in these 30 minutes that I was talked, I hope that I was able to uh, go from the pain at up to the way that we're uh, supporting the market and solving this issue, I also bring the purpose back. And I hope I was able to show you that this purpose or this goal is not something that is just a talk. It's something that we do. It's transforming an idea, transforming a problem, transforming pain in an opportunity in material and then something different. Thank you very much for the time given to me. And um, this is the end of my presentation and I'm now open for questions. Thank you, Filippi Fagunji's PDI, uh, Research and Development and Innovation Manager of the FCC Group. We now have about five minutes for you to respond to some questions that uh, participants have asked. So, Philip, let's move to the first question. The first question that was sent to us is the question that comes from Marco Juarez Heischer. Congrats, Filippi. Additives that would eliminate the virus and other viruses as well. Are these being added to face masks, protective face masks? Thank you for the question. Yes, for sure, because we have to, would, we separate things. What I presented to you, um, our area of knowledge is non-porous surfaces, in that case, plastics. But here you're talking about porous surfaces. So it's textiles, right? So we know that there are several groups that are carrying out similar activities in textiles for the manufacturing of masks and the evaluation norm is an adapted norm for textiles, but it's also possible to do this to see these metrics and this is the important point we emphasize the plastic area in my talk but the vision of textile is also a reality other groups are working on this and we believe that uh, in this format uh, the manufacturing plants adapting and bringing these realities 
supporting this uh, comeback process to this new normal. Filippi, the question now comes from Elu Viebeck. This, this plastic surface, uh, is it defined or is it does it independent of the porosity of the plastic? Thank you for the question. We, we must understand that when we apply the additive in a, on a product, we have to understand, of course, the type, what is the transformation process and how it's going to be utilized. Normally, if we're talking about uh, uh, material that's additive before the processing, we're talking about doing this in all the mass of the material. If we're talking about all the mass, each one of the layers of the plastic will be added, it will have this additive. And adding to what I showed you, the monometric uh, size of the additive particle, n times smaller than the virus, will have homogeneously on all the surface the active principle of this additive. So in this way, we believe that uh, notwithstanding the porosity, but, but not going into absorption, but um, our, independent, our vision independent of the layer, if we have this activated on the polymer mass, it, it would all be treated, including our materials often uh, have an abrasion process. So let's say that the uh, the first surface is uh, wasted by usage, for example, if the additive is in the mass, each one of these layers has been treated. So with this, we can offer safety during the whole life of that, pro uh, that device. Now we have another question, Philippe. It comes from Andrieli Bras Banzetu. Nanomaterials introduced in the polymer could, could uh, be harmful for recycling. I imagine that her question is the vision of nanomaterials is a sort of a wide scope, but talking about the additive test that we carried out, as I said, the big differential is how to offer to the market something that uh, attends to the goal minimizing the impact in the transformation process that already exists. Therefore, the vision is that no, it won't affect the re recycling. And what we believe is that a recycled item, the additive should be compensated. So the weight of the material has to be compensated by the additive, but we don't have the vision that this can be uh, harmful. So, so even if it's um, disposed of, we have studies and data showing that there's no leaching. So the active material, it does not uh, doesn't leak out of the material going into the soil. And this gives us uh, the sense of safety because we are talking about the disposal of solid waste. Philip, we don't have too much time, so we'll move on to the last question. The last question comes from Marcia da Silva, the protection of the plastic. Uh, part with the, is it temporary or is it forever? Forever, Does this have to be reapplied uh, now and then? Thank you for the question. No, it doesn't have to be reapplied because it's on the polymeric mass. But of course, if we have a paint job on the surface and the surface is additive, it's only that paint that will have the protection. But in the vision of the whole thing being incorporated into the mass, we believe the time of the activity of the additive is the same as the, the life of that part or that piece. So the its life, is equal to the time that the additive will continue working. 
The other questions will be sent to the to Filippi Fagundes, and he will reply after us. We thank you so much for your participation, Filippi. Thank you very much. I thank you. Congrats for the organization of the event. Thanks for the invitation, and um, enjoy the rest of the talk. And we are available to debate more about this subject, about the innovation process, other ideas. We are at your disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Filippi Fagongis. Now, to access the simultaneous translation, could, uh, select the language you want to listen to on the left-hand side of your screen at the top. The materials, the slides that are being presented by the lecturers are available on the website cbplastical.com.br. At the side menu of the platform, there's an option of synchronizing data. So you can click on the option sync, sync data. Now, we invite you all to interact, publishing on Twitter, Instagram, and the hashtag is CBPlastico. Your image will be published at the sand of the Institute, which is called Sustainplat. Remember, you should not have a private account. Oh.